Hi, a very good morning all of you. Wondering what this orange shade is all about? I have a small surprise for you. Here it is. I was lucky enough uh, to wake up early in the morning today and capture this beautiful, amazing, marvelous picture of early rising sun. I mean, uh, this is what actually inspires each and every one of us at a very basic level. That is, we all have a different level of connectivity with Mother Nature, uh, several aspects of nature. We, we are connected uh, at different levels in our own way. Appreciating that would bring more inspiration and positivity in our life. That's what I believe. Right? Okay. So let's jump into our today's discussion. So we'll start with the following illustration. So we've been mentioning about several illustrations regarding cellular glands, cross sections, histologic images and all. So let's review some information. As you can see, this is schematic diagram of a typical cellular gland. A represents serous isina. Of course, it's a cross section. B represents serous demilunes. C, mucous isina. The intercalated duct, I think this was the question which is asked or which was posed in the recently concluded exam. And E represents striated duct, and F represents terminal excretory duct. Right? So let me know if you need any further clarification. Now, uh, moving on, palato gingival group. So this is on the distal aspect, palato radicular group. Let's review some information. So presence of palatogenial group, as you know, especially in maxillary incisors, may be a predisposing factor in localized periodontal disease as given in Wheelers and also Cadenza. This group is also referred to as palatoradicular group. As you can see, it's extending from crown towards root distally. Moving on. Also, there seems to be another image-based question related to serous stimulo. Now, see if this information helps you in answering your query. So as you can see, uh, submandibular glands, as you know, they are mixed glands containing both serous and mucous secretory units. The serous units predominate, but the proportions may vary from one lobule to the next. The mucous terminal portions are capped by demilunes of serous cells, as you can see in this particular histologic image. Moving on, growth on gingiva is one of the keywords which I received. Peripheral ossifying fibroma is the other keyword which I received. So just observe this image and let me know if uh, the question is altogether completely different, right? So we'll update relevant information in the description part of the video accordingly in 24 to 48 hours. So as you can see, this particular lesion, peripheral ossifying fibroma with some uh, typical clinical features which we'll review now. Peripheral ossifying fibroma can occur at any age, although it appears to be somewhat more common in children and young adults. The clinical appearance of lesion is characteristic but not pathognomonic. It is well demarcated focal mass of tissue and gingiva with either sessile or pedunculated base. It is of same color as normal mucosa or slightly reddened. The surface may be intact or ulcerated, and it most commonly appears to originate from interdental papilla. The surface of a peripheral ossifying fibroma exhibits an intact or more frequently an ulcerated layer of stratified squamous epithelium. The bulk of lesion is composed of an exceedingly cellular mass of connective tissue comprising large number of plump, proliferating fibroblasts intermingled throughout a very delicate fibrillar stroma. The lesion is quite characteristic in its high degree of cellularity in contrast to usual simple fibroma. Right? Moving on. Malignant melanoma, image-based question again. So let's review some information. As you know, malignant melanoma is a neoplasm of epidermal melanocytes. It's one of the more biologically unpredictable and deadly of all human neoplasms. Although it is third most common cancer of skin, basal and squamous cell carcinomas are more prevalent comparatively. Malignant melanoma accounts for only 3% of all such malignancies. Malignant cells often nest or cluster in groups in an organoid fashion. However, single cells can predominate. The melanoma cells have large nuclei, often with prominent nucleoli, and show nuclear pseudo-inclusions due to nuclear membrane irregularity. The abundant cytoplasm may be uniformly snowflake or optically clear. Occasionally, the cells may become spindled or neurotized in areas. 
So when you're going through histologic images, simultaneously reviewing information will definitely help us in identifying relevant slides or relevant cells in the histology. As you can see, extreme left on the screen, it's a vertical growth phase of malignant melanoma characterized by malignant melanocytes invading the underlying connective tissue. And bottom, you can see two illustrations. The middle one, the radial growth phase of pre-malignant melanosis, which is characterized by atypical melanocytes within the epithelium, intraepithelium. So this is radial growth. And then we have in the extreme right, the vertical growth phase, which is characterized by malignant diploid melanocytes, as discussed previously, invading the underlying connective tissue. And also I would like to discuss one keyword, buckshot scatter. Uh, even though it's not asked in the exam, but I consider this very, very important. So the intraepithelial component or radial growth phase, as you can see in the left part of the screen. So the intraepithelial component or superficial spreading melanoma is characterized by presence of large epithelioid melanocytes distributed in so-called pegetoid manner. This pegetoid spread within the epidermis is sometimes known as buckshot scatter. Okay. I hope this information is helpful. Now, moving on to the next topic, mandibular first molar again, image based question. So you identify and tell me which is left and which is right. So the one which you can see on left side of the screen is left mandibular first molar. And on right side, it is right mandibular first molar. Just try to orient the occlusal surface within an you know, oral cavity or within the oral cavity of patient uh, so that you'll get more clarity on whether it is left or right. And if you observe the occlusal aspect, always remember the buccal side has three cusps and the smallest cusp is the distal cusp. These are the clues you have based on which you can identify whether it is left or right, isn't it? Now, moving on, Ludwig's angina. I think the orange tinge is even more prominent and evident now. Okay, it's the early rising sun. <clears throat> so Ludwig's angina, so uh, case-based question. So let's review some information related to same. As you know, Ludwig's angina is named after German physician Ludwig, which is an acute, potentially life-threatening toxic cellulitis beginning usually in submandibular space and secondarily involving sublingual and submetal spaces as well. And there are several other aspects to it, but we'll confine to clinical features. Now, the patient with Ludwig's angina manifests a rapidly developing board-like swelling of floor of mouth and consequent elevation of tongue. The swelling is firm, painful, and diffuse, showing no evidence of localization and paucity of pus. There is difficulty in eating, swallowing, as well as breathing. Patients usually have high fever, Rapid pulse, fast respiration, and moderate leukocytosis is also found. And as the disease progresses or continues, swelling involves the neck, edema of glottis maca. This carries a serious risk of death by suffocation. Next, the infection may spread to parapharyngeal spaces, to the carotid sheet, or to pterygopalatine fossa. Cavernous sinus thrombosis with subsequent meningitis may be sequelae to this type of spread of infection. So life threatening, as mentioned in the description part. Right? So this is some information from Schaefer's. Let me know if you need any further clarification. Moving on, baroreceptors and their effect on blood pressure. These are the keywords which I received. We discussed the same in our study club e classes previously. Baroreceptors are receptors which give response to change in blood pressure. These are also called as presso receptors, and there is a lot of literature available on them. We'll confine it to its relevance in managing blood pressure or its effect on blood pressure. The baroreceptor mechanism acts against the rise in arterial blood pressure. It is called pressure buffer mechanism for this reason or pressure buffer system. And the nerves associated with these baroreceptors are called as buffer nerves. I hope this information is helpful. And also consider Mary's law, Mary reflex, very, very important, right? It's a cardio inhibitory reflex as we discussed previously in study class. Moving on. A role of beta blockers in angina. So these are the keywords which I received. So as you know, we have various anti-anginal drugs which prevent about or terminate attacks of angina pectoris. And angina pectoris is a pain syndrome due to induction of an adverse oxygen supply demand situation in muscles of myocardium. Two principal forms are recognized: classical angina, which is the most common, and then we have variant of fringe metals angina. And you can see literature suggesting the role of beta blockers in angina. Review this and let me know if you need any further 
clarification. Moving on to the final topic of this video, factor egg deficiency, which type of hemophilia, these are the keyword status there. So as you, as you know, hemophilia is a group of sex-linked inherited disorders characterized by prolonged clotting time. However, bleeding time is normal and usually it affects males and the females being carriers. Because of prolonged clotting time, even a mild trauma causes excess bleeding which can lead to death. So even a simple extraction can lead to bleeding continuously. Hemophilia A or classic hemophilia due to deficiency of factor 8. Hemophilia B or Christmas disease deficiency of factor 9. Hemophilia C or factor 11 deficiency due to deficiency of factor 11. Right? So these are some of the keywords topics which I wanted to highlight in this specific video. Let me know if you need any further clarification or if you have any queries. Of course, you can get back to my 24 by 7. And please give us at least 24 to 48 hours to address your queries in mails as well as in the comment section below. And if any update is available relevant to topics, we'll post them in description part of the video as soon as possible. I appreciate your love and understanding. Wish you all the best. Love you all. Have a fantastic day ahead.